So I'm going to begin with Marjorie Hill, who's the Chief Executive Officer of the Gay Men's Health Crisis. Um, GMHC, is, as probably most of you know, is the nation's oldest aid service organization, provides a continuum of services to 15,000 men, women, and children annually with a world-renowned legacy of healthcare advocacy, promoting social justice, and supporting lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender rights. And prior to her work at GMHC, Dr. Hill was the Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of HIV and AIDS in the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And we know that New York City has always been on the forefront of prevention and uh, of really promoting public health. Uh, in the New York City Department of Health, uh, Marjorie was responsible for the development of citywide HIV AIDS policy, oversight for over 400 prevention care and treatment programs, and expansion of the syringe exchange program. And my favorite fact here, Marjorie, was that during your tenure, you oversaw distribution of five million male and female condoms annually. That's a lot of sex. <laughs> And so with a firm foundation in grassroots organizing, Dr. Hill is committed to a career in public service and will share with us her thoughts and perspective and expertise on prevention and treatment from a structural view. Thank you, Jeanette. And, and I actually want to thank each and every one of you for a couple of things. Um, while in your research and in your programmatic life and perhaps in your personal life, you deal with HIV and AIDS, we are the minority in this country. And I'm not talking about black people in this instance. Um, a lot of people outside this room think that HIV is not that big a deal, that it's over, that it's so much better. And part of that is true. But if it were entirely true, we wouldn't be here all day in this room trying to figure out how to really stem the tide of HIV in this country and this region and in the world. So I really want to thank you for um, you know, doing what you do to really combat HIV and AIDS. Um, I um, am a little bit of a storyteller. Um, so I'm going to tell a couple of stories, because um, it's late in the day. Um, there was a uh, husband and wife, and the husband had developed these strange um, symptoms. And his wife was getting on his case, honey, you should go to the doctor, you should go to the doctor. And he's, he was dreadfully afraid of going to the doctor and wouldn't go. So she kept saying, honey, it was getting worse, it was getting worse. And he said, well, I'll go if you come with me. So she says, fine. So she goes with him to the doctor, and the doctor examines him. And he says, I can't bear to hear it. Um, you know, I, I really need my wife for you to tell my wife, and then I will, um, and then I, she can tell me, or you can tell me, or whatever. So he steps outside, the wife comes in, and the doctor says, your husband has this rare disease, rare disease. And, in order for him to get better, you're going to have to wait on him hand and foot. And you're going to have to meet his every need. And you're just going to have to fulfill all of his desires. And if you do this, he'll get better. Thank you, doctor. I really i am glad to hear that. And she goes out, and she says, husband says, honey, what is it? She said, you're going to die. <laughs> so. Um, the moral to that story is that can, can biomedical and behavioral approaches talk to each other? Well, maybe. But that's not really what I'm going to talk about. Um, you know, the, the reality is that I love the title of this conference that uh, science equals prevention. Uh, and part of the reason why I like it, and I think maybe the reason that motivated the organizers to name it, is it reminds us of whether we're activists or not, uh, whether that's the particular hat we wear, banner we carry, all of us remember silence equals death, uh, and how that really transformed and changed and took um, uh, both physical and psychological space in our nation and in our world. 
Well, I'd like to suggest to you this afternoon a third mantra, justice equals life. The three things I'm going to talk to you uh, in the time that I have, and then I'll be happy to answer questions, are really about the social determinants of health. Because the reality is that whether we're researchers, whether we're program planners, or whether we do Debbies or not, the challenges of race, gender, class, poverty influence and affect our HIV prevention success and often dictate our failure. Secondly, I'm going to spend a little bit of time focusing on one particular challenge around those barriers, uh, stigma. Uh, while we are just about on the eve of the 30th anniversary of HIV and AIDS uh, and GMHC's 30th anniversary, um, Things are so much better. When GMHC was formed, and I'm sure when many of the organizations were formed here in Connecticut, what we did was help people die with dignity. We raised hell, and we helped people die. We made the government pay attention. Not much else. I mean, they weren't giving much money. And you know, so the attention in some ways, it took a couple of years for it to translate into real effective um, interventions, and some might argue that the government still, even with the National AIDS Strategy, which is very wonderful, um, still has a long way to go. And thirdly, I'm going to offer some examples of what the social determinants or social drivers are and what some effective ways GMHC and others have done it. So, you know, social determinants of health are the social economical, economic, political, and environmental factors that influence one's well-being. Well, the goal of HIV AIDS prevention has always been to change the behavior that puts individuals at risk, to minimize those risks, to take that risk out of the way, and to give the person control. But the prevention, HIV prevention in particular, has always been dominated by the individual. So whether he puts on a condom, whether she carries a condom, whether or not an individual takes personal responsibility. And don't get me wrong, I think personal responsibility is important. Um, but if we look at where 90% of the HIV cases are in the world, that includes, you know, sometimes when we talk about global AIDS, I always want to say, okay, America is part of the world, right? I just want to check. Um, when we look at 90% of where HIV cases are in the world, they occur in places where there is significant poverty all over the world. That's true in the United States, it's true in Thailand, it's true in South Africa. Poverty is very highly uh, associated with HIV incidents. Doesn't cause it, but very highly associated with it. So the progress of looking at these social drivers has been limited. I remember many years ago, I went to maybe my first CDC meeting, and I was like, oh shit, oops, did I say that? I'm going to the <laughs> CDC. Um, and I felt like I had one message that I wanted to say, and that message was that racism was driving HIV. And I remember the um, director of the Division of HIV AIDS Prevention uh, looked at me and said, well, Dr. Hill, what do you want us to do, end racism? <laughs> I've thought about that moment, that was probably about 20 years ago, I thought about that moment many times because I wish I would have said yes. Uh, now, there is some um, justice in continuing a fight and, you know, sort of fighting a good fight and, and sticking to something you believe is right. Uh, I was part of a peer review. CDC did a peer review of all their HIV prevention programs, and Dr. Fenton, in his welcoming of all of us, probably about 100 of us across the country. Um, he said, one thing the CDC has not done, particularly in HIV and AIDS, is owned racism, owned sexism, owned homophobia. And under my watch, 
That's what we want to do. We want to understand, Dr. Fenton said, the social determinants of HIV. So what, again, are these social determinants? Well, again, I talked about physical, social, cultural, organizational, community, economic, legal, or policy as, or aspects of the environment that influence is one's life. Well, that's everything. But you know, if we're trying to really stop HIV, if we're trying to stop the clock, uh, I think most of us know that in this country, every nine and a half minutes, there's a new HIV case. So that means since we arrived this morning, not a math major, but about 40 people have seroconverted today. If we're going to make that time frame longer, we can't just give out condoms, we can't just do sister, and we can't just argue about whether or not community viral load is an important, inter uh, an important concept. It is. But the reality is that all the medication in the world is not going to do any good if someone isn't taking it. 45% of individuals on HIV meds in New York City are inconsistently taking their medication. Have a diagnosis, have a doctor, have a prescription, have insurance, okay, because they're, they're taking meds, right? Some, somebody's paying for it, 45%. So that means all of the great medicines and all of the treatment as prevention language that we're throwing is only, only half of the people are catching it. Okay. What are some of the structural approaches that have been used in terms of addressing HIV prevention? Um, the uh, World Health Organization is really focusing on microfinancing and really focusing on microfinancing with women. Um, and that Part of the focus around that is to see, you know, women have, um, in many cultures, uh, do not have equal standing, certainly not sexually with men, even though they may be equal. And so the reality is that um, I remember when my first job at GMHC, I was director of the Women's Institute, and I was going out, very exciting work with peer health educators to beauty parlors. And we were giving out condoms left and right. And one of, the, one of the peers came over to me and said, well, I'm ready to go. And I said, well, why, why are you ready to go? She said, well, they all taking condoms, but none of them are using them. So what are you talking about? She said, they have pocketbooks full of condoms, but they don't feel empowered to pull them out. And so we started doing, you know, sort of condom training and condom demonstrations and Somebody taught me this thing about cheeking, and I'll, if you have a question, I'll tell you what that is later. The people who are laughing know. Um, but we, we, just giving somebody a condom when they don't have um, the security, the personal security, is useless. Giving someone all of the Debbies in the world, and we do lots of Debbies, we do Debbie good, okay? But, if someone doesn't have a roof over their head and if their baby is hungry, Debbie is not going to help them. Legal actions. Uh, up until um, this year, it, the United States had a ban, a travel ban on individuals who were HIV positive and enforced it. Um, several countries still have travel bans. What does that mean? You know, in a day and age when scientifically we know you don't get it through a suitcase, what does it mean to have a travel ban? In this country, right now, any man, whether he says he's gay or not, who has had sexual intercourse with one man since 1973 cannot give blood cannot give blood. It doesn't matter how many shortages, it doesn't matter how much he practices safer sex, does, it doesn't matter if he's net, it doesn't matter. He, it's prohibited. Even though the American Red Cross says it is bad public policy. Foolish. Why? 
because of stigma, because of structural um, challenges around uh, identity and around uh, who people are. Uh, social mobilization, in, in Australia, they really grabbed hold of the challenge around MSM and have done really phenomenal work. And the government really led the charge around um, MSM gay men and really promoting um, community responses and, and, and um, visibility of LGBT community and a visibility of gay men and have really uh, managed the HIV epidemic in a far superior way than we have in this country. Uh, up until a few years ago, the CDC was reluctant to say the word gay. Now, you know, I understand where all of us understand where MSM came from and men who have sex with men and not everybody wants to be identified as gay and that's, that's wonderful. But in the prior administration, there were limitations around both condoms, around gay, around sex in general. Um, we spent millions of dollars in this country on abstinence-based sex education. Actually, I don't understand that. What is abstinence-based sex education? I don't entirely get it, but we spent millions of dollars even though we had research that showed that it had limited effectiveness as a solo um, exclusive intervention. Um, the looking at places like Calcutta, Thailand, and the uh, Dominican Republic, which now really promote and have laws that not just say that, that sex workers should use condoms, but making those condoms available by um, in, in supporting um, the industry. And you know, we, we in America as, as a country are very uncomfortable with that, but it's not stopping people from going to sex workers. Um, so our judgments around uh, sexual activity, sometimes heterosexual, sometimes homosexual, um, but are, are not public health pronouncements, yet we let those attitudes and values dictate our public health interventions. So, so what's, the, the, what's the downside about these, sex, these, sex, these um, social determinants and structural drivers? Well, as I said earlier, it's, it's a lot of stuff. You know, if, if we're really going to talk about fighting racism, ending racism, ending gender disparities, ending homophobia, um, you know, that we, we can't quite figure out how to get sex ed in high schools. Um, so, so how do we do this? It's, it's a very broad uh, topic. Um, that there are uh, some of us who came to the field of public health did not come because we wanted to be activists. We came because we wanted to focus on health outcomes. And so it feels like not quite the right um, fit, if you will. Um, and that is, it's, in, it's very expensive. I mean, you know, however we were going to do it, if we found this magic bullet that was going to make racism go away, it would be a pretty hefty price tag. So how do we do this? How do we, if we accept that it's not just about science, it's not just about treatment, it's not just about Debbie's, it's not just about condoms, how do we address the social drivers? Um, when I was assistant commissioner for the HIV Bureau, um, Tom Frieden, who's now at CDC, was the health commissioner. And um, he gave me one charge during the three years that we worked together. He said, get syringe exchange in Queens. Um, in, I don't know what the issue, I don't know how it's done in Connecticut, but in New York State, We've had syringe exchange programs uh, for probably since the, before the Dinkins administration, so about 20 years. Um, but there had not been a new syringe program probably for about 10 years. And we looked at the, uh, the incidence of HIV in 
uh, Queens and in Staten Island, and there were three, several areas in Queens and one area in Staten Island that had very high incidence of substance use, injection drug use in particular, and very high incidence of HIV. You don't have to be, you know, like a Yale um, epidemiologist to figure that out, right? I mean, you know, there's the area. However, those areas in Queens, none of the groups who would be doing syringe exchange felt like it was even worth trying because of the um, tremendous community um, challenge. And so um, the Commissioner of Health challenged the Assistant Commissioner of HIV. And by challenge, it meant go to those meetings. Tell me the meetings that I have to go to. Meet with the community groups. Meet with the faith-based groups. Meet with the politicians. It took us two years, but we now have, when I left, when Tom and I left, there were nine new syringe programs in Queens. Um, and I'm not as up on those statistics in terms of incidents, but when we look at incidents of where there are syringe exchange programs in New York City, we saw a 50% reduction in incidents over about two or three years. So I'm assuming that that's what's happened. That is a, a social determinant intervention. Um, we have a campaign, I don't know if anyone's familiar with it, at GMHC, it's called I Love My Boo. And it's a campaign that promotes um, positive, affirming, loving interaction between young gay men. It's targeted to gay men of color, and they are pictured um, holding hands, hugging, um, you know, in very sweet ways. Not the way that we typically see uh, young men of color, uh, no matter what their sexual orientation, and we certainly don't necessarily promote um, two gay guys, you know, kind of one kissing the other on the cheek. So we have this whole maybe 10 or so um, uh, uh, cards with these different pictures, and on the back, there's stories about who they are. And they talk about being proud of themselves as gay men and being proud of their community and about being in love and about part of being proud and part of being in love is taking care of yourself and taking care of the person that you love. So that's our HIV prevention intervention. Um, I'm outside the state, but I, I, I already had the conversation, so I'm gonna say it. Um, if you're in New York City, it's, I don't know if it's running now, the New York City Department of Health um, just did an ad about HIV. And it's one of those, some people might remember the, um, those Your Brain on Crack ads. Yeah. Well, it's the HIV version. So it says, it has a young gay guy and it says, you have a 100% chance or 89% chance of getting anal cancer and you're gonna get AIDS, dementia, and you know, and it basically says, it's better not to get it. Well, you don't have to spend $2 million to tell somebody it's better not to get it. Um, but you should spend $2 million encouraging people. So we've been in a, we and other organizations have been in a discussion with the Department of Health, um, my friends there, about is it better to do affirming messages or is it better to do scare tactics? Now, the truth of the matter is that my argument is we don't have enough money, we need to do many campaigns, and some of them might be affirming, and some of them might be scare tactics, and hopefully there'll be a lot more in between, but that didn't get much play. Um, the, the third example I wanna give you is around our workforce program. Um, we, GMHC has a workforce program. We place about 300 individuals in um, uh, significant, uh, uh, important, um, preferably beyond minimum wage work. Uh, and we do that by uh, helping them with resume writing, um, with job skill assessment, with training. Um, we're in a cohort of about eight uh, uh, not-for-profits. We're the only HIV organization. And uh, up until about three or four months ago, we were number one in placement. Um, we had the lowest recidivism rate. Um, we had the highest retention. We're, we're running neck and neck with, you know, now we're, we're who's number two? Is it Hertz or Avis? Um, we're number two right now, but we're working on it. Um, but one of the things, we started the program because about six years ago, some individuals, some clients came and they said, 
I thought I was going to die. I didn't. So get me a job. Now, we could get an HIV test. We could get an apartment. We could get a, you know, we could get child care. We could get food. We could get legal services. But a job was not within our um, uh, purview of expertise. And so now we, we looked at it and we started this workforce program. What did we learn? Well, in addition to that there are people who want to return to work who can make a significant contribution to society, who, um, you know, are not, you know, just who want to work and should work if they can. But that was one piece. What we found are the clients who are in work first Work, workforce development, who are active in that program, have better labs, have higher treatment adherence, because we, we get that. We know how often they go to a doctor. That's part of what we track. Uh, and they report more comfort in engaging safer sex. And at first, we were surprised. But then, when you think about it, if you have something to look forward to, if you're feeling good about who you are, then you want to do all you can to be as healthy as you can. And you're getting affirmed for that. So workforce development, my um, director of workforce, talks about GED as a condom, a job as a condom, you know, going to college as a condom, a promotion as a condom. So, so that the, to sort of look at one's capacity to earn, um, to be a, a, a contributing member of society. We do taxes um, as part of our um, um, services. And um, the first year we did it, there was a lot of resistance around it. So we kept encouraging clients. We do it for all clients and anyone who, as an individual, earns under 35000 I think, for an individual. And, um, all we needed was one person to get a, a refund. I think it was like $1,500, and then there was a line. Um, but what does it mean if you um, don't necessarily have a lot of discretionary income? That's another fact I just want to share about, my, about, my, uh, uh, about the, the clients we see at GMHC, for you to get an income tax check. What does, that, what does that do to the person that you are and how you feel about yourself? And, and whether it lasts for as long as you, you know, until you cash it, until you spend it, or however it long it lasts, that's about how long it lasts for me, um, in terms of you know, my being happy about paying taxes to the federal government. Um, it does make a difference. Um, one of the challenges around HIV I talked about earlier is poverty. Um, the 10,000 HIV positive individuals that we see, we obviously do intake and we take lots of information. 75% of the clients at GMHC are at or below the federal poverty line, which in New York City is, I don't even know how they could say this, but it's $10,000 a year. So 75% of our clients earn $10,000 a year or less. I mean, how, you know, New York City. I mean, I don't know what the cost of living is in New Haven, but in New York City, that doesn't cut it. Um, probably not here either. And so those kinds of challenges um, distract people from condom use, distract people from treatment adherence, distract people from, you know, negotiating safer sex. Do we need any further proof that structural drivers uh, are uh, an important piece of the work that both researchers, uh, both individuals who are um, treatment advocates and um, treatment as prevention advocates, as well as individuals who are wed to more traditional behavioral interventions? Because all across that spectrum, if we're not getting to people, if we're not keeping people, if we're not addressing their true needs, then we're not going to be effective. We provide about 95,000 hot meals every year. And it's really interesting to me because we have a lunchroom that um, provides hot lunch, hot lunches Monday through Thursday, and dinner on Friday night. It's, uh, cultural, traditional thing we've done. 
Um, we started the MEALS program about 23 years ago at a time when it was really about having a social network and an opportunity for people to uh, have a safe space to interact. Um, but again, if you think about the figures that I shared with you, the clients who are coming for a hot meal now, some of them, it's their only hot meal. And the first of the month when many of our clients get entitlements, um, we probably see about two or 300 people in for a seating, you know, for our period of time that we're offering a meal. But at the end of the month, we can get six or 700 people because, you know, money's tight. Um, for us to only think about whether they're wearing a condom or not, or even whether they're taking their medication or not, and they're hungry, where we would fall short. Uh, in addition to the um, social justice importance of that, many of us in this room know, but treatment uptake is better when someone is well nourished. So you have two people who are on their meds, taking their meds regularly and consistently and appropriately, if one is getting you know, good nutrition and regular meals, their uptake is gonna be better, their labs are gonna be better. It's crazy, or, or maybe it's not. Um, so we have an obligation. In my three minutes I have left, um, stigma, you know, 20, nine and a half years into the epidemic, things are so much better uh, that uh, it's not a death sentence. Uh, we have uh, many celebrities who talk about HIV and AIDS. Um, you know, we have Magic um, who talks about it and does so appropriately now, I'm glad to say. Um, but I'm a psychologist by training, and the only clinical thing they, I tease my staff that they let me do is I run a support group for women. And the women in my group, we meet every other week. In fact, we're meeting tomorrow night. And um, they have been living with HIV. The least amount of time is 12 years. The longest amount of time is 18 years. And one week we were, doing a, we were ending a group, and one woman said, well, does anybody have an empty aspirin bottle? And I'm thinking, what a weird request is that. And I said, what's that about? My sister's coming, I gotta disguise my meds, she's all up in my medicine cabinet, because you know when people come to your house, they look in your medicine cabinet. Everybody knows that, right? If you don't, I'm telling you, people look in your medicine cabinet. Um, and so I said to her, no, wait a minute, your, your sister? Now this is a woman living with HIV 17 years. She said, if I told my sister I was HIV positive, my niece and nephew could not eat at my house. We have had individuals come to GMHC, a woman comes to mind who um, didn't want a meal, didn't want safer sex support, um, didn't want a doctor, um, didn't need an apartment. She wanted a psychiatrist not, not a social worker, not a, not a psychologist, a psychiatrist to tell her only daughter, her 30-year-old daughter, who had just had a baby, that it was okay for her to hold her only grandchild. You know, um, we can do better. We have to do better. Um, so silence equal death. Um, Silence equal, science equals change, and justice equals life. Thank you very much. Dr. Stephen Morin um, is a psychologist as well. Uh, that makes three of us up here from, the na from that nasty science. Uh, he is a professor of medicine and chief of the Division of Prevention Science in the Department of Medicine at UCSF. He is the director of the Center for AIDS Prevention Studies and the AIDS Policy Research Center. Dr. Morin is also associate director of the UCSF Center for AIDS uh, Research, or the CIFAR. 
He holds the Walter Gray Endowed Chair in HIV AIDS Science at, oh, at the AIDS um, Research Institute. And for a decade prior, from 1987 to 1997, Dr. Morin hung out down in Washington, D.C., where he was the principal legislative assistant to Representative Nancy Pelosi, and also worked for the Labor HHS Education Appropriations Subcommittee. And so while in Washington, Stephen played part in almost every AIDS-related policy at the federal level. Steve has also served as co-chair of the HIV Prevention Trials Network, or the HPTN Community Working Group. Uh, his research on HIV prevention, surveillance, disparities, and more is noted for its scientific excellence and scope, and also its impact locally, nationally, and globally. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Morin. Thank you so much. Of course, it's hard to follow Marjorie, but I want to commend her for her comments, and I want to, since you got a story, I, I'll tell a story too. Um, <laughs> this MSM thing can be a problem. I, I was doing a letter last week, a letter for a colleague, and I was endorsing her grant proposal, and I was saying she had these large cohorts she was following, and she was doing an excellent job on, on um, men who have sex with men, but I dropped the N on the end of men. So it read, we were doing a large study on men who had sex with me. <laughs> Anyhow, this large cohort I went on to say, never mind. Back to the topic. Did she get the grant? You don't know yet. Um, the topic today is treatment as prevention. Uh, to go back to my days on Capitol Hill, particularly the six years with the Appropriations Committee, uh, this was not the concept we heard much of. What we heard a lot about was treatment versus prevention. Which were you going to fund? Which was a higher priority? What is really interesting in uh, today's discussion is that we're talking about the concept of treatment as prevention and the way in which they can, uh, there's synergy. The other debate that we're uh, maybe going to have is about how much of this is behavioral and how much of this is biomedical. So why don't we start on that? Um, I don't need to review the with you, you've heard uh, today a lot about the uh, national HIV AIDS strategy and particularly the goal of reducing new infections. Some of this concept of treatment as prevention go went to a uh, modeling paper out of South Africa that really took the thesis, can we treat our way out of the epidemic? In other words, if we got maximum number of people in treatment, we suppressed their viral load, they were no longer infectious, how long it would it take to get rid of the e epidemic? Well, that's wildly optimistic, but it, um, modeling in the United States does suggest that, in fact, if you took a test and treat approach, you could significantly reduce the number of new infections. However, advocates uh, um, like Marjorie made all their points, and uh, they've come up with a term, uh, testing linkage to, uh, linkage to care plus treatment to recognize the need of all of these support services like housing and uh, nutrition and all, all the like and old-fashioned social work that must be accompanied with any approach that attempts to do a test and treat strategy. They also focus on the need for this to be voluntary and that no one should be compulsory tested or treated. Um, I'm going to move a bit to implementation science. Implementation science is uh, a process where you go through and you, you decide you want to implement something like a TLC plus strategy. What are the problems? Where are the gaps in being able to deliver the product? And you'll see here um, in this green, there are four major problem areas. The first is that um, up to 21% of the people in the U.S. are undiagnosed. Uh, when the second um, green bubble, uh, when they do get di diagnosed, it's late. Uh, and the third green bubble is that they're often not linked to care post 
uh, diagnosis. And then the th third and really unrecognized problem is the extent that one third of people who know they have HRV are not in care. So these three gaps become the research agenda. And what's interesting about them is they're not necessarily a biomedical research agenda. They're almost all social, behavioral, and policy research um, objectives. So let me take you through some of these uh, one by one. Uh, first challenge, identifying people who are undiagnosed. Uh, we know uh, we can do, but haven't been doing, social marketing campaigns on the importance of knowing one's status. Uh, we could implement the, uh, I know Paul Cleary's been working on the uh, barriers to implementing routine testing as recommended by the CDC. Uh, but there are other strategies as well. We do have the CDC recommendations. They, by and large, they have not been um, implemented the way they were intended. Uh, this is a study we conducted at six community health centers with the National Association of Community Health Centers in uh, Alabama, um, South Carolina, and Mississippi, where you'd expect to find a lot of infections. But of the people seen, there are nearly 60,000 people seen. Uh, when these people were committed to doing routine testing, only 28% of people seen were offered the test, and of those, only 69% accepted, and when all was done, only 14 were linked to care. In fact, there were 19 false positives more than there were true positives. So it's not just implementing routine testing. You have to choose where you're going to find the maximum load of new infections so that you can be cost efficient. And good places are emergency departments and STD clinics and other places where you can expect to find uh, a coincident HIV infection. We looked uh, recently at three such uh, emergency departments in the poorest neighborhoods in the San Francisco Bay Area, mostly in Oakland. And what we found is that indeed uh, the programs differed wildly. The definition of routine was very different. But we did find some successful um, programs where people, at the time of notification people were linked at that time to care. So there are models out there that could be replicated. Second area for research, identifying individuals earlier in their infection. So how do you do that? Um, we have a large trial in Africa where we're doing community mobilization and testing, and we've tested large numbers of uh, proportions of communities and greatly in increased by more than uh, fourfold the detection of cases. So you can do it with a careful mobile mobilization. You can do such things as text messaging and um, small incentives for regular interval testing. We're talking about frequency of testing here and community level um, interventions so that you make frequent testing normative, particularly, in, uh, particularly with gay men um, who are using serosorting strategies. Community mobilization itself comes from diffusion of innovation. This is the cell phone. Few people have it, other people like it, da 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 da. It becomes normative to have a cell phone. Well, we use the same basic uh, theory to make it normative to know your HIV status or to test it uh, at intervals of six, three or six months. So these become, uh, you go in, you work with the communities, you involve community leaders. Almost all of these groups are motivated by larger community goals and you have to work these strategies in there, but the goal is through all of this mobilization is to increase detection and linkage to care. A good example is the campaign uh, that's been up and operating for a few years in Washington, D.C. Uh, they've looked at uh, providers for provider-initiated testing. They've been working in the jails. They've been doing advertising. and they have been able to increase from 2004 to 2008, almost fourfold increase in testing and a 17% increase in uh, new, newly diagnosed cases being identified. 
And if you see this chart, you'll see that each year the mean uh, CD4 goes up, indicating that they're getting people earlier and earlier in their infection. So these campaigns can work. The other part about early detection is really early detection, and this is uh, the work on acute infection. You'll see in the first three to four weeks of infection, people are highly infectious, and it's important to try to capture as many of those people as possible. So, uh, we need better testing technology to find these, although we probably the biggest yield is going to come from campaigns of providers where the providers uh, look to for the symptoms. If someone comes in after a high-risk exposure and is reporting fever at night, those sorts of things should trigger testing for both antibodies and antigen. Uh, campaigns among high-risk individuals, these are high-risk negatives, don't screw with the flu. Um, get uh, carefully evaluated every time you have a temperature or it looks like the flu. Uh, we need to change our counseling protocols so that when people are detected during the acute phase, they are told that they are more infectious and that they have to be much more careful, careful about transmitting to others. And we have to develop a public health system that is able to respond quickly so that the tests don't sit in laboratories. Uh, this is just a slide on one of our studies, and this is actually a study we did with Yale. Um, you'll see these graphs. These are um, people who were acutely infected, and what happened before they were diagnosed, you'll see the um, blue is uh, positive partners, the purple is negative partners, and the green is unknown, so they had a, um, a mostly negative and unknown partners. At the two time intervals we interviewed them post-diagnosis or disclosure of their HIV, you'll see that the partners are almost all HIV infected. So the notification in and of itself led to zero sorting and greatly reduced the probability of transmission to others. I was going to sing the advantages of rapid technology that's coming out, although this particular product bombed at the Croy meeting a couple weeks ago, but there are other ones out there, so don't take this one too seriously. But uh, the fourth generation EIE will be able to address many of these issues. The next part is promoting not just testing, people who've never been tested before, but how frequently should people test? So this is promoting regularly testing among people who um, are at very increased risk because of their behavioral profile. And what we found is that people will respond and test at three month intervals if there's some incentive and if you just text them to tell them to come in at a, per, uh, at a specific time. They think it's a great idea, particularly if you explain it uh, in terms of the benefits to them and the risks of acute infection. So in the next area, um, and this is, this is different than most study sections see. They, you know, we've spent so much time with studies that really look at condom promotion or reducing number of partners or that sort of goal. Studies on linkage to care have not been great. But treat, uh, it is a very important issue. In our surveillance systems, uh, people who have been, not been seen in the last six months uh, have average viral loads twice those of people who have been seen in care in the last six months. So treatment, uh, the viral load on the individual level is extremely important and you'll see it's important on the community level as well. Various strategies to link people to care. This was a CDC study, uh, case management. It worked fairly well. We have much better uh, we have much better interventions in the pipeline now. With some of these navigator, I'm not going to go into detail, but these come out of the cancer literature where uh, when you're diagnosed, you get a, a patient navigator who goes to appointments with you and tells you what to expect, all of that. They're culturally matched, and we've been able to get over 90% people linked uh, within a month period out of our programs at the San Francisco General Hospital, so we're very optimistic that these adapt, uh, these came largely out of the um, Boston group in the Fenway Clinic, but there's 
uh, a lot of potential there for linkage. Again, careful studies have to be done, and they haven't. Retention in care is even uh, more important. If you look at quarters in care and uh, adjusted uh, hazard ratio of death, you'll see that um, the, the differences are quite enormous, that you uh, really are um, at great risk of death. This is death endpoint, uh, if not retained in care. So what do we do to retain people in care? Almost nothing. So uh, it, uh, here, here's, this is ripe for research. What works in retaining people in care? We know that they like to see the same person at the front desk. They like to see a matched provider. There are things that could be done. Linkage and retention are very distinct. And in engagement in care over a long term uh, is the primary predictor of health outcomes. So a, a research in this area is very important. What we do know is that substance abuse, mental health, uh, housing, all of the things Marjorie talked about are primary predictors of retention and that we could do a much better job than we're currently doing. So we have, uh, as researchers, problems even in the definition of what, what is retention. We have no controlled trials in the literature. Um, it's, we don't have a literature that's actually linked to the content of the visit. So there's much room for impro improvement. All we have is a couple retrospective studies from VA hospitals. So uh, for people wanting exciting areas of new research, which are primarily behavioral, although they're about retention and care, this is a great area to focus. The, um, once you get people in care, the issue is maintaining viral suppression as a way to improve health outcomes. As many of you know, the treatment guidelines have been uh, changed so that uh, treatment is recommended for CD4 cells under 500, but San Francisco and half of the guidelines committee now endorse treatment for everybody as soon as they are diagnosed with HIV. The advantages is that you treat it uh, as an inflammatory process and you can get better health outcomes at an individual level. Of course, this is the individual's choice, so it's only a discussion with the individual, and they make an informed decision in consultation with their providers. There are potential downsides to it, but those all have to be dealt with in terms of the risk and benefit involved. One of the benefits is reduced transmission risk to others. The modeling we've done in San Francisco suggests if you go with the treatment guidelines of the CD4 under 500, you can basically reduce the number of uh, new infections. Uh, the net result would be about by 33% in uh, 2029. But if you treat everybody, you see that goes to 55%. And if you test people at these six month intervals uh, and uh, treat everyone, you could reduce by as much as 81%. So, the ability to have major impact on reducing the number of new cases is there. Uh, how do you improve health outcomes among those in care? Adherence is essential. We know from a body of research that's well studied, we know the interventions that work, we just need to implement them. We know that substance abuse is high in this patient population. We know it, it is one of the reasons people do not link or retain in care. We can screen for it in waiting rooms. We can refer for treatment. We can do much better, particularly with electronic medical records where you can do the screening and do the prompts. And while you're at it, you can do prevention with positives. Very important, can be done a number of different ways. We have all of these um, interventions that have been proven in uh, randomized trials. However, without getting into details, a uh, paper we're just publishing right now, provider-based interventions are the shortest and are by far the most cost-effective. 
And indeed, they're, they're very simple to do. Screening is done in the waiting room. A message is sent to the provider. It's clipped on the chart. Uh, it uh, takes, takes, on average, about a minute and a half. OK. So various people are saying, OK, these things are all very important. How do you put them all together? And there are a number of studies like this. The HIV Prevention Trials Network has a TLC plus protocol they're doing in DC and in the Bronx. And you'll see the study components are very much about the five issues I just talked about. So it, there's pretty good agreement on what this strategy should look like. You can add all kinds of optimum, opt, optional um, interventions along with it. Uh, the other one you heard a bit about from Judy Arbach this morning is the 12 City Project that um, was initi is initiated by the CDC. They're doing uh, an attempt to implement, or at least plan to implement, the national AIDS strategy in these 12 uh, metropolitan areas. Some of our HIV prevention science centers and CFARs are involved in this project as well. One that I don't have a slide on, but HRSA is about to initiate uh, a project of replicating this in eight states. So eight states will be selected to implement the national HIV AIDS strategy, and that will be evaluated in that context. Yeah, you can just see what the goals, very much what I've been talking about are the goals of, of uh, the CDC project. And we um, are proud to be a member of a five group, five center collaborative uh, with Yale, Columbia, Medical College of Wisconsin and UCLA that are looking at very much the same issues, trying to assess the effectiveness of multi-level interventions, primarily with community viral load as an, as an outcome as a, uh, because it is a good marker for uh, uh, diagnosed new HIV cases. So these are some of what's in the process. Now I'm going to courageously go talk a bit about San Francisco and what's happening there. Uh, San Francisco, yeah, San Francisco has a population of about 800,000, but we have uh, 18,500 living with HIV, so we have very high prevalence. And MSM, who are not IDU, we have a prevalence of 23% of the MSM who are IDU, it's 47%. So we got a lot of HIV, and over 90% of it is in MSM, MSM IDU. So um, here's a couple questions. Behavioral or biological? This is looking at trends over the last five years in unprotected anal intercourse. So you see it's gone from 42% to 33% in, among, that's the green line, that's the negatives. Is that going to produce a decrease in incidence or not enough? And among the positives who can transmit, you'll see it's gone from 57 to 60. It's actually gone up. So is that enough behavior change to bring down incidence? Number of partners, flat, no difference. This looks, uh, at, you know, this looks at something very different, though. This looks at unprotected anal intercourse in the last six months with a potentially discordant partner. So this is serosorting. And if you look at the negatives, the green line, we've got an awful lot of serosorting because all that unprotected sex is uh, part of a serosorting strategy. So that many people think if you have this serosorting strategy, been controversial, very controversial, does it work? Are we going to get reduced incidence because we have been doing this for five years? Yes, no. Is it good enough? It's behavioral. And then substance abuse. Um, you'll see substance abuse has been fairly flat, but there's been uh, this lot, bottom line is methamphetamine, which has been our biggest risk factor among the substances, and it's gone from 12% to 8%, way high, but still 
some improvement. Is that enough to bring down incidents? Probably getting a lot of shaking heads, it's probably not enough. So those are kind of some of the behaviors. If you were just looking at this as behavior, would you expect incidents to go up or down? Okay. How about some more information? Over <laughs> from 2004 to 2008, among MSM, tested in the last 12 months went from 65 to 71, so it went up 6%. That's good. Is that going to help? Among those tested in the last six months, it really went up by 12%. This is because people who choose a sorting strategy have to test at least six, uh, every six months to be credible to their partners. So uh, if you have a sorting strategy, you get more frequent testing. Does that reduce incidents? Um, the number of people or uh, who are HIV positive, who don't know their status, declined. Declined quite significantly below the national average, down to about 17%. Should that help? That's part of the national aid strategy. Does that help reduce incidence? All right, and then we get into these other things that are really part of test and treat. Engaged in care went from 71% to 78. That means that they're showing up regularly for appointments. We have a universal access program in, in San Francisco called uh, San Francisco Cares. Um, we have universal access to ARVs. So uh, these are really surprising numbers going from 74 to 90% of people on ARVs and probably the most impressive, going from 52 to 70, uh, increase of 20% in the people living in San Francisco who are virally suppressed. Should that change incidents? Yes or no? Is it gonna go up or is it gonna go down? It's gone down. It's gone down from 798 cases to 434 cases a year. So can you get 25% or more reduction in incident cases? Yes. Now, you have to, now you have to tell me whether that was behavioral or biomedical. <laughs> was that behavioral or was that biomedical? All of the above. Uh, the point is that you can't in these uh, combination approach, uh, approaches to prevention and multi-level interventions, much of which were driven by the community and were not planned, I might add, um, you cannot separate out which is which. So that the only way to really have these kinds of combination preventions with these significant outcomes is that you do all this at once. And you try to do a better job at each single point of potential intervention. And with that, uh, I think there's considerable hope that these principles from the National HIV AIDS Strategy can be implemented. Although ARVs are clearly a biomedical intervention, there are so many of these behavioral components that make it happen that it can truly be described as a joint behavioral and biomedical approach. To get back to your question is, can these two approaches uh, successfully converge? And I'd say yes, and that they already have. And that the lessons learned here can be transferred to almost any local jurisdiction. Although it's going to be measurement issues, there are going to be funding issues, there's going to be community preparedness issues, there are going to be all of that to sort through. Thank you.